topic of Xinjiang is very well suited for Department of East European Studies because as uh, Uyghurs would claim uh, descendancy to the Yuan dynasty and to the Mongol heritage, they would also uh, claim that uh, Xinjiang used to be part of Eastern Europe at a certain or used to control Eastern Europe at a certain point of history. So I think uh, uh, it's uh, the, affil the thematic affiliation to the department is uh, without any problem. Um, I have done. I have been doing uh, research on Xinjiang since uh, year two thousand. No, nine uh, ninety nine. Nineteen nineteen ninety nine. Yes. 1999, when I started studying uh, Uyghur language uh, in Prague from my colleague, Professor Veronika Zygmundova, who also, apart from being a Mongol and Manju specialist, she also lived in Guja, uh, which is in northern Xinjiang, so she speaks also Uyghur language, apart also from being a Shiva, Shiva specialist. So she taught me the essentials of Uyghur, then I applied for a Sasakawa Ryoichi grant and I studied one year in Urumqi and since then I've been going back to Xinjiang and also working uh, with Uyghur language at a uh, number of other occasions, for example, interpreting, etc. Um, I decided uh, to focus the talk on current situation in Xinjiang because I think there is not enough discussion on this topic in the media and in the public sphere. Uh, please feel free to interrupt during the course uh, of my talk and I'm sure we will have a lot of time for questions after and for discussion. So uh, I will start with a historical introduction. Xinjiang vis -a, uh, as uh, posited in China. Um, usually uh, you can read uh, in literature published in People's Republic in China, you can usually uh, read the formulation inseparable part of China regarding Xinjiang, which means, uh, which is a claim that uh, Xinjiang has been since time immemorial part of China. Um, in fact, Xinjiang has been for the first time incorporated into uh, Chinese uh, or China-based empires. We shouldn't use the word China so far back. We should probably, the most proper formulation would be uh, James Millward's formulation, China-based and China-based uh, dynasties or China-based power. Uh, first time was during the Han Dynasty for um, several tens of years. Uh, another time that Xinjiang became controlled by a uh, China-based dynasty was during the Tang dynasty, which established a protectorate also for a short time, uh, between 7th and 10th century. Uh, final incorporation into uh, Chinese empire was during the Qing dynasty in 1759 or 1760. So. Uh, we can see that uh, in total the part of um, Xinjiang being controlled by Chinese dynasties is about 400 years. Uh, during these uh, other periods it was uh, either um, it either functioned as a cluster of uh, independent uh, city-states as a very maybe could be compared to uh, polis or it was controlled by uh, nomadic empires, which uh, colonized it uh, coming from the north, such as the Mongols or the Jungas. Um, with the incorporation into uh, the Qing dynasty or Qing, Qing Empire in, 19, in 1759 or 1760, we can say that it was the final moment of um, the ancient uh, Mongol nomadic empire em, em, imperial tradition because uh, the moment of uh, incorporation of nowadays Xinjiang was the moment of, or it happened by the defeat of uh, Jungar Han, Hanait and uh, which was based in uh, n northern Xinjiang today and then uh, as a byproduct uh, the Qing also subdued or uh, let's say conquered uh, nowadays uh, southern Xinjiang. So it was at that moment that, that uh, Xinjiang was uh, named uh, Xinjiang, which means New Dominion. He, even 
the word says that it was newly incorporated incorporated into into China's empire. Um, since uh, this moment, uh, Qing Dynasty and uh, even uh, Republican China and uh, even today's uh, Communist China or People's Republic of China have been uh, facing uh, two major issues or two two questions which are not uh, peculiar they are not special for Xinjiang. One one problem is uh, the frontier question or the frontier issue, which means uh, how to incorporate uh, the vast frontier regions into the empire as. Uh, as tightly as possible, and a closely related problem is a so-called minority question, or national, or in modern age is a nationality question, which means how to make the people inhabiting frontier regions, how to convince them to be loyal to the central government or to the yes yeah, central government, uh, be it. Uh, capital of the Qing Empire, or be it uh, capital of Republican China, or be it capital of uh, People's Republic in China. It's always a combination of these two issues interrelated together. The frontier issue and the nationality issue. <clears throat> uh, since 1759, or since the moment of incorporation of Xinjiang into China, uh, we can say there have been uh, incessant uh, uprisings or uh, smaller or larger rebellions, attempts uh, at uh, secession or declaring independence. The most uh, successful ones are probably Jakub Beck's uh, rebellion or Jakub Beck's uh, occupation. Jakub Beck was, was a military officer from Hokand. He was probably half Tajik, half Uzbek, if we apply uh, these categories backwards in time. Uh, who ventured into Xinjiang in uh, 1865 and took, uh, took advantage of uh, a series of rebellions which were going on simultaneously in each of the oases at, at the time, Xinjiang, so-called Hoja rebellions. So Jakub Beck managed to control the whole territory of southern and eastern Xinjiang until, 17, 18, until 1878 when he died, uh, probably because of a stroke in the fall, and uh, his uh, empire um, collapsed quite quickly. Um, Another quite uh, notorious attempt at uh, secession was so de a brief declaration of a so-called First East Turkestan Republic, which was declared on November uh, 12th, 1933, and lasted only a few weeks until February 1934. It was, very, it was uh, dysfunctional in pretty much all the aspects of, uh, uh, of a criteria for functioning states, such as state administration, taxation, um, e uh, economic policy, monetary policy, uh, military, etc. Uh, we can say it mo was more of a rhetorical attempt at establishing a modern state. Uh, second was a more successful, so-called Second East Turkestan Republic before, between 1944 and 1949, which was declared um, in three northern districts of Xinjiang, hence uh, its Chinese name, three uh, region, three districts rebellion, or even Uyghur name, is the same. Um, there is a consensus uh, that the Second East Turkestan Republic was again uh, only partially motivated by Uyghur or Turkic nationalism. More it was uh, instigated by the Soviet Union and functioned more as, more as a, a puppet regime to create a buffer zone between Kuomintang administration and the Soviet Union. So, so there wouldn't be a direct border. 
Uh, with the year 1949, we can see uh, historically um, unprecedentedly strong incorporation of Xinjiang into uh, China-based power, in this case People's Republic of China. Uh, so far never in history Xinjiang was uh, so closely, or the territory we today call Xinjiang was so closely incorporated into China. It's uh, demographic uh, balance has been very successfully changed from uh, 5% of Han people in uh, approximately in the year 1949 and into more than 50% of Han people. So this is one very uh, successful policy of the state, uh, changing the demographic ratio. Uh, there are a number of other extremely successful policies which uh, People's Republic of China accomplished in, in the region. Um, all the policies of People's Republic of China, we should stress that they are not new. They have been tried or devised in the past. But uh, what uh, People's Republic of China succeeded in or is succeeding is uh, the degree of or the success of their incorporation. So, uh, for example, large population transfers from Inner China into Xinjiang, they have been attempted before, even during Han Dynasty, Tang Dynasties, but they never worked even during Republican China. Uh, it is now only People's Republic of China which is uh, succeeding in this level. Again, also uh, economic policy. Uh, Xinjiang has seen um, tremendous development over the past 60 years, material, economic development, cultural development, uh, modernization strategies, um, integrating, integrating um, the region with the interior China, etc. We, we should not forget that all these policies have been very uh, extremely successful. Um, I would now like to maybe mention a little bit uh, in greater detail about the particulars of the policies. I have uh, used uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese characters and uh, the terms in English are directly translated, so if you think the names sound a little bit strange in English, it is because it's a direct translation from uh, contemporary Chinese documents. So, uh, core of um, or the, the essential policy in People's Republic in China of China is uh, concerned with the economy since uh, the beginning of. Um, period of uh, reform and opening Kai Ge Kai Fang since uh, 1978. The most important issue the government is uh, thinking about is uh, economy. So, um, <clears throat> major economic plans have been uh, or are being implemented in Xinjiang. Uh, Largest one has, has been going on since uh, 1999 when it was announced and launched, so called Great Development of the West, Sipu uh, Takaifa. Um, it's a major plan of developing Western uh, two thirds of China, which uh, and uh, Xinjiang is conceived uh, or is understood or is developed as a uh, the core city of northwestern development, which means uh, Urumqi is a center of uh, economic development. It's a, a so-called core city, Hsin Changshir, of, no, of northwestern development, investment in infrastructure, construction, etc. Uh, the government uh, has been um, uh, implementing so-called leapfrog development. Uh, again, it's a term of um, official apparatus. Uh, leapfrog development uh, means, all, again, large economic uh, massive plans conceived uh, from exclusively top-down manner with a very little consideration for actual impact or any feedback from uh, bottom-up from the local level back to the center. There are plans formulated in Beijing, this is important to stress. Um, 
they rely on a huge uh, central government investment and also population transfer etc uh, another important uh, um, instrument of uh, government's economic policy is a so-called Xinjiang Work Forum. Xinjiang Work Forum is a meeting which takes place uh, every uh, several months. Uh, from The first one has been held in 2010 in a reaction to big uh, riots or ethnic unrest in uh, July 2009. So, and the last uh, Xinjiang Work Forum was held in uh, May 2014. And uh, it is a meeting of uh, top uh, officials responsible for uh, Xinjiang policy, including top uh, state leaders, such as uh, Xi Jinping or Hu Jintao, etc., where the policy is formulated. Um, assistance to Xinjiang, another program, uh, involves uh, assistance to uh, particular cities and it also it again involves a huge government investment also involves uh, population transfer from uh, inner China into into Xinjiang another important en entity we should mention in this context is a so-called uh, Xinjiang production and construction corps uh, which is a organization um, which again is a let's say, a continuation of uh, imperial mechanisms of uh, agricultural colonies which were established in Xinjiang already during the Han Dynasty, but uh, they were used already during uh, Western Zhou Dynasty where uh, military colonies, military ag agricultural colonies were established by um, ruling dynasty or ruling house to um, conquer uh, from barren or deserted uh, frontier lands which couldn't support uh, large amounts of troops. So the army, they had to come first, they had to first uh, grow their own crops and make a harvest and uh, produce their own food because the, usually the, the places uh, in northwest, uh, they couldn't support a new large amounts of people. So. This is the principle and after the harvest the army was only then able to proceed on so this is a mechanism existed at least in the western Zhou dynasty when they were called Qing, Beijing the Qing and uh, they have been uh, used during uh, Han dynasty under the name uh, Tun Tian and uh, Han dynasty in Qing dynasty etc. Et Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps uh, are a um, modernization of this mechanism. They have been formed in, uh, uh, immediately after proclamation of uh, People's Republic of China, 1949, when uh, demobilized Kuomintang soldiers and uh, other um, social groups, let's say, were formed into these corps and sent to Xinjiang to uh, start uh, colonizing the land, uh, uh, growing crops, etc. Uh, they were originally also intended to function in a military way, uh, first to guard the borderland against external aggression and second to suppress internal unrest. <clears throat> Today the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, they function mostly as an economic entity because in 1980s they have been allowed to uh, establish their own businesses, so they function as a major economic player in, in Xinjiang economy. Uh, this organization is uh, controlled uh, directly by the central government in Beijing and uh, in Xinjiang it uh, administers lands uh, this is the map of uh, Ping of uh, Xinjiang Production Corps uh, of the areas controlled by this organization. So we can see it's mostly, uh, we don't have a beamer, but it's mostly around uh, important uh, roads uh, along state borders and along water resources. So this organization functions as a 
alternative administration of this land. It has, uh, it runs their own schools, their own um, courts, etc. Uh, it's not, as I, as I mentioned, it's not subordinated to uh, regional government, the government of Xinjiang. It's uh, controlled directly by the government of Beijing and uh, it's usually headed by the general party secretary of Xinjiang. Um, below are names of uh, names of uh, cities which are controlled by Pingtuan, by Xinjiang Production and Construction Corp. So we can see that the number or the speed with which uh, new cities are being built or constructed in Xinjiang is growing. And uh, it means that more and more land, uh, as I'm saying, strategically or economically very important land along water resources, uh, cities, I mean roads, communications and state borders is controlled by an entity not subordinate to the regional government of Xinjiang. Uh, it's also very um, uh, ideologically, very strictly controlled uh, organization. There is a campaign of so-called Ping Tuan spirit, etc. It functions in a, it still functions in a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, civilizing uh, resin Dante. Uh, another important mechanism is a nomad sedentarization campaign. Maybe some of us uh, are familiar with the sedentarization of nomads, which is going on today in uh, um, Tibet and other Tibetan areas, uh, such as Qinghai or Sichuan. So analogously, uh, nomad sedentarization projects are going on today in, or Currently, the past few years in Xinjiang, they are target, targeting uh, Kazakhs and Kyrgyz. Uh, because uh, Kyrgyz uh, in the southwest of Xinjiang, they have been um, actually still living in a nomadic uh, way of life until very recently. Uh, Xinjiang is... Uh, well, why? Xinjiang is very important for the central government for a number of reasons. One of them is uh, energy security. First, Xinjiang is a top producer of uh, many natural resources domestically. Uh, lots of oil, lots of natural gas, coal is uh, produced in Xinjiang and shipped to, the, to eastern China. And also through Xinjiang there are many uh, uh, extremely or indispensable um, energy corridors which go from uh, from the west to the eastern Chinese uh, coastline so we can see on the map there is a pipeline from uh, Kazakhstan and fr from Central Asia already existing which transports gas and uh, oil there is another pipeline which is uh, being built uh, from South Siberia uh, we can see that's the in plant pipeline uh, in the map. That's uh, it goes through about a uh, sixty kilometer long section of the border, uh, which has uh, which Xinjiang has uh, with Russia. So, uh, with this uh, pipeline under construction, China will be able to use a large amount of Russian uh, Russian gas from Siberia. Another pipeline, which is not uh, in the map, is a plant pipeline from a Pakistan uh, shore, from Pakistan coast, from Gwadar port, through Karakoram, again back to Xinjiang, up to Xinjiang and to eastern coast of China. By this pipeline, China will be able to bypass um, militarily very vulnerable energy corridors, uh, uh, on the sea, the maritime silk route al along uh, Indian and Southeast Asian coast, which is a where is a, where these corridors are being uh, contested by or challenged, or they are insecure due to ongoing tensions in, uh, in Southeast Asia 
where China is competing over control of Sprachia Islands, Paracel Islands with uh, Vietnam and a number of other countries. So the proposed pipeline from uh, Pakistan through Xinjiang again will solve, will first uh, make the oil to, for Chinese uh, energy demanding eastern coastline much cheaper and also more secure. So uh, energy security is a major reason why Xinjiang is indispensable for uh, People's Republic of China. Second reason is uh, commercial connectivity and transportation connectivity. Xinjiang is, uh, as I mentioned, Urumqi is a core city of uh, development of north, uh, northwest China. Major investment plans from the central government, also from abroad investments are going into Xinjiang. Uh, large uh, amounts of goods are being traded with uh, uh, directly with Central Asia or are transported via Central Asia on eastwards all the way until into Europe. Um, new um, rail lines are being built between uh, Kashgar and Kyrgyzstan, Kashgar and Tajikistan. Uh, etc. So Xinjiang is uh, very important in regards of uh, transportation and commercial connectivity also. Uh, another reason why Xinjiang and all other boundaries or frontiers, uh, border regions are indispensable for uh, People's Republic of China is the imperial legacy. Because um, China traditionally has uh, perceived itself as a cultural center of the world. I think like many other civilizations in the world, this is not anything special to China. Uh, the problem with uh, losing Xinjiang, Tibet, Inner Man Mongolia, Manchuria and other frontier regions would, for China would be that it would not be the center of the world anymore. Uh, this is the scheme of uh, some of us are maybe familiar with the publication by or with an anthology edited by John King Fairbank, uh, published in uh, 1968 called The Chinese World Order, which uh, researches, uh, it's a pioneering work, I would say, in uh, researching China's uh, relations with the tribut tributary states, vassal states, etc. So this is the cover of the book, uh, China's position, self-perceived -perce position in the world. So um, this has also a lot to do with, uh, um, let's say, a high degree of uh, politicization or politicization of public discourse on Xinjiang in China, such as the formulation Xinjiang being inseparable part of China since time immemorial, etc. Again, nothing special for China. Uh, I mean, nothing special. Uh, uh, these uh, mechanisms we can find in a, in a number of other contexts all around or throughout the world. Education policy. Uh, very important policy in order to... or for solving the nationality question. As I mentioned in the, in the beginning, uh, nationality question, or in other words, how to make the inhabitants of uh, borderlands loyal to the central government. Uh, an issue which every government of every multi-ethnic uh, state has to cope with. Uh, education is uh, important. Education and nationalism, as I'm sure we are aware, are the is the religion of modern state so education as a core mechanism for implanting state implanting state values um, so-called bilingual education uh, a plan which has been again not devised by people's republic of china nor by republican of republican china uh, efforts at uh, uh, making inhabitants of uh, nowadays Xinjiang speak Chinese and learn, accept Chinese cultural norms and mores uh, and ways of behavior 
have been um, traced, on, or the beginnings of this policy have been traced until uh, the 1830s, following incursions from Hokan Henei, when we see a policy shift from uh, in the central policy from um, administering Xinjiang as a somehow uh, very loosely affiliated uh, military administered protectorate, indirectly ruled. Uh, and uh, since this shift, China, uh, Xinjiang is being administered as a part of China, as a, as a part of a state which has a strictly defined border and uh, is um, directly administering um, all its affairs, including uh, religious affairs of the indigenous population, including education of the indigenous population, uh, etc. It's uh, in the in the 1830s when uh, Xinjiang changed from uh, uh, from frontier into borderland because roughly at that period the uh, borders of Qing Empire suddenly became closely or precisely delimited and the loosely functioning system of uh, Karun, for example, stopped uh, effectively operating. Uh, we can first see maps which delimitate uh, Qing Empire with uh, clearly given borders, etc. So, um, efforts to um, linguistically uh, um, incorporate inhabit Turkic population into Chinese Empire by uh, by teaching them Chinese and making them use Chinese uh, are traceable thus far. But again, as I mentioned, it is only the People's Republic of China which is. Uh, really good at implementing this plan and succeeding in this plan. Bilingual education. Uh, bilingual education is again it's uh, official terms. It's a uh, point or its nature. Its uh, goal is to make Uyghurs speak only Chinese. So. Um, it's hard to understand why exactly it's called bilingual. Uh, it, uh, its measure is uh, that uh, in uh, uh, that uh, Chinese uh, b is becoming the sole medium of in instruction in all schools, with the aim of uh, increasing uh, Chinese language abilities of Uyghurs within the scope of about uh, four generations. Uh, Uyghur is seen as a language which is not uh, fit uh, the needs of modern age and uh, modernization, um, etc. So this is this is uh, the officially declared reason why uh, Chinese is being implemented. Uh, another similar measure is called uh, so-called Xinjiang classes in Inner China, Xinjiang Pan. Uh, this program it was uh, it recently saw uh, some attention in uh, in uh, English language media. So, Xinjiang classes uh, are opened in Inner China for elite or students or for Uyghur students with very good grades, which are given scholarships and transferred into Inner China where they spend, I don't know, four years of high school, senior high, even universities where they live uh, in Chinese-speaking environment and uh, the, um, the plan or the intention of this, the goal of this policy is to make uh, Uyghur elite students to become fluent in Chinese and in, again, Chinese culture norms, etc. Uh, another important uh, measure or sphere of policy is a religious policy. Uh, patriotic religion or patriotic uh, or training of uh, patriotic religious personages is a mechanism of uh, state control over Uyghur, over Islam. Uh, Islam as a religion, as a transnational religion which uh, seeks uh, 
uh, or whose, uh, let's say, sacral center is uh, outside China. So Islam is seen as a poten potentially very subversive uh, ideology with, or with a very subversive potential for the um, Communist Party of China. Uh, so, similarly to Christianity and other religions, other transnational or universalist religions, it's uh, very closely monitored. Um, for example, religious personnel is chosen by the state, it's um, trained in, uh, in uh, how to explain the proper functioning of religion in socialist uh, state. Uh, it's normal that during uh, religious uh, sermons, the imams, they have to integrate uh, positive uh, feedback on uh, government or even directly, literally mentioned uh, um, communist pol or policy of Chinese Communist Party, which is uh, often perceived by Uyghurs as, very, Uyghurs as very controversial. Uh, for example, collection of speeches on explanations of religion is a, mm, is a let's say, textbook which is used uh, in today's Xinjiang to, by religious personnel to um, during sermons, etc. It's a mm, manual how to explain uh, functioning religion in a socialist state. Uh, cultural policy. Cultural policy uh, evolves uh, again a lot around religion. It's uh, centered on prevention of penetration of religion uh, into public sphere. The implication is into public sphere. So the state uh, seeks to uh, oust religious practice from uh, public spaces, so there is a uh, forbidden uh, relig religious acts are forbidden in public spaces, so called religious uh, attire, or uh, which means uh, traditional um, headscarves or um, face uh, coverings, uh, which is not really traditionally strong issue in, in, in uh, Central Asian Islam or in, in Xinjiang at least. Uh, all these are being forbidden, even long beards, etc. Uh, so this is a, again um, very controversial policy. Um, Kashgar is being trans uh, transformed into a special economic zone. It has been a proclaimed a special economic zone modeled on the example of uh, Shenzhen. So again, uh, this is a very strong policy. Again, it was tied to, uh, for example, demolition or so-called modernization of uh, Kashgar, old city. Very, uh, very controversial. Uh, urbanization plan where uh, overwhelming majority of Kashgar old city was demolished and is being rebuilt in, uh, into modern housing. Uh, Meshrep, um, cultural activity which has been declared uh, intangible heritage of the UNESCO has been uh, stripped or has been interpreted in China as a purely uh, cultural event, whereas uh, in, tradi in a traditional conception it also contains lots of uh, religious elements and also a number of uh, social mobilization mechanisms, uh, which uh, are supposed to supplant many functions of the state, such as uh, uh, judicial verdicts on communal misdemeanors, etc. Mm. Suppression of dissent uh, or dissenting views, uh, we can see over past years very strong um, suppression of uh, public debate or even indirect public debate, such as uh, in literature, Nur Mehmet Yassin in, uh, is a one example of this tendency imprisoned for writing a story about. Uh, wild pigeon, 
which uh, prefers to die uh, instead of uh, living in a cage. So it's a very powerful allegory for which Nur Mohamed Yassin was in prison for 10 years. Ilham Tohti, uh, probably, or maybe some of us are familiar with uh, uh, Professor Tohti being sentenced on, I think, 23rd of uh, September for life or receiving a life sentence for separatism for running a website called Uyghur Biz, which uh, reported uh, in Chinese language on situation in Xinjiang um, and uh, specifically sought to build uh, bridges or to enhance uh, understanding of Xinjiang issues by Han people. So uh, the um, for activities like this and writing essays in, in this sense, Ilham Tohti was imprisoned for life. Uh, I have a couple of pictures here. Uh, this is a government website of uh, um, Ining government, which is a region in northern Xinjiang, which announces launching of um, uh, educational and propagandistic uh, activities called or centered on uh, diluting religious uh, awareness and therefore or thereby building a civilized and healthy life. So Islam many times in public discourse is uh, associated with something uncivilized, something backward, uh, something unhealthy even, such as here. So. Um, policy which incurs strong reaction from Uyghurs. This is a spray-painted um, official um, uh, warning, yeah, warning, that's the word, uh, from the, a wall in Kashgar against uh, illegal pilgrimage into Mecca. Uh, pilgrimage in Mecca today is very... is. Um, Mm, state control, so you have to apply. It's a quite a, quite a procedure. The application to apply uh, to be allowed into a delegation, which is making a pilgrimage into Mecca. So it means you before that you have to uh, receive or go through a, a enormous, uh, enormously deliberate set of clearance procedures. Then another issue is uh, become, uh, getting a passport for Uyghurs, etc. So it's a really an ordeal. On the other hand, uh, individual pilgrimage into Mecca is uh, forbidden. So uh, Uyghurs are not allowed to go by themselves to Mecca. So many of them uh, resort to going indirectly via Malaysia, for example. They used to do it via uh, Central Asia. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, for past 15 years to go through Central Asia. So again, very, very sensitive uh, policy. Uh, on the left, left uh, is a page from Uyghur Primer. Um, I think all primers in the world are a little bit simple-minded. Uh, nevertheless, this page says that Uyghur's uh, homeland, since time immemorial, was China and that their uh, ancestors lived and uh, toiled in uh, China for generations in the past. So, um, again, very, um, very uh, strong statement. On the right, that's a picture which incurred a very uh, um, turbulent uh, social debate uh, in Xinjiang, if we can call the few comments which went through uh, the internet websites a public debate, uh, a flag uh, hanging in above the above the mi mihrab it's mihrab yeah 
uh, above the mihrab in the direction of Mecca. So the Uyghurs or Muslims, they are not bowing to Mecca like this anymore. They are bowing to the flag of communist China, which is a, a atheist, uh, anti-religious uh, political doctrine. So again, a uh, very strong reaction in Uyghur society. Um, it is interesting in this context that, uh, for example, two, uh, Chinese-speaking Muslims, the Hui, Tungans, they don't seem to have such a big problem with uh, in incorporating uh, state, uh, state symbols into, into religious practice. For example, it is, I have heard from uh, friends that it is quite uh, mm, frequent sight to see uh, flags state flags on Tungan mosques in uh, southern China, for example. So uh, this is a very different uh, way of reception of this uh, state symbology in Uyghur and Tungan society. Uh, on the left, uh, that's a sign uh, forbidding state employees, women, children under 18, uh, party members, etc. from attending mosques. On the right, uh, that's a sign which says, uh, which calls on women to unveil their faces and uh, with doing so that they do not uh, interfere with uh, modern society. So again, uh, mm, very for in Uyghur society, it is very uh, at first it's very offensive to ask women to unveil their faces when they want to have them veiled. And again, uh, traditional um, dressing is associated with something uh, uncivilized here. So again, uh, very controversial. So these are uh, state policies. What is the reaction to the state policies? Security situation in Xinjiang has been going through uh, everything or... or um, Every other aspect of public life in China has we can or we can somehow discern periods of so-called liberalization or thawing versus uh, tightening or sh or freeze or show. So um, liberalization 1950s, yeah? um, beginning of uh, communist uh, um, China. The party acted very um, cautiously at first in Xinjiang. Uh, next, uh, so-called 20 years of Cultural Revolution. In Cultural Revolution, of course, as we all know, lasted from 1966 until 1969 or 76, depends how we counting. However, again, Jim, Jim Milward's very apt uh, term, 20 years of Cultural Revolution, because uh, in Xinjiang, the anti-rightist campaign, Great Leap Forward, Cultural Revolution, somehow are perceived uh, by Uyghurs as one campaign against religion, against Uyghur identity and uh, Uyghur language. Uh, 1980s, it's a period, it's a fun period, so liberalization. Uh, regional autonomy law was passed uh, as well as a uh, new constitution of China, which stipulates certain uh, rights of uh, minority nationalities. Uh, this uh, period was uh, interestingly uh, similar to period of Islamization of Pakistan and, and uh, the Afghan war when uh, China was uh, on the side of the United States against um, the Soviet Union. So um, uh, Xinjiang became a, a region through which China was sending uh, personnel, military equipment, uh, food to Afghanistan. Also some Uyghurs were trained in uh, using arms by China and sent to Afghanistan to find, fight against, uh, against Soviet Union in this period. In, uh, in Pakistan, in northern Pakistan, we see a boom of uh, private uh, uncontrolled religious uh, education, religious schools, which uh, in number of uh, cases or um, places uh, 
educated Uyghurs in radical Islamic extreme violent ideology. Uh, from 1990s uh, or in 1990s we can see first clashes, violent clashes in Bahrain, for example, which is a town near Kashgar, uh, where Uyghurs, uh, okay, so the, um, there was a armed clash with the police and Uyghurs occupied police station, the, the shooting went on for three days, etc. Another uh, occasion of uh, mass demonstrations and um, clash of uh, Uyghurs with the, with the state was Khopan 1996 in Huja 1997. Uh, we see first cases of uh, uh, terrorist attacks which we would uh, define um, by or how, when which we would, could perceive as terrorist in the sense that they were aiming at the uh, civilian population uh, means uh, so-called indirect strategy so this is a strategy used by um, extremist uh, um, forces or organizations in order to coerce a state to change its policy so in this moment they target a third uninvolved actor to inspire terror or yeah terror or horror and to coerce the state to change its policy so uh, bus bombings on public tr uh, uh, buses in Urumqi 1992-1999 uh, then until 1907 was a period of uh, again uh, loose period of uh, when nothing serious happened in Xinjiang or nothing at all actually uh, um, we see a revival of violence in Xinjiang since 19, uh, since 2007. Uh, until today, or until this year, there have been, in past years, more than 50 casualties per year in Xinjiang, which classifies the situation uh, as an armed conflict. Uh, typology of these attacks are very, is very complicated. These attacks, uh, most of them are on uh, state organs, on police, on checkpoints, on officials of uh, family planning policy bureaus who are inspecting uh, Uyghur households and they become, they get into conflict. Um, so it's a, we can call these uh, direct conflicts of uh, radicalized Uyghur individuals with uh, organs of state power, usually web, they are very badly organized, very or not organized at all. Uh, they use, uh, or weapons which are used in these attacks are knives or homemade uh, explosives. Uh, we can see also terrorist attacks, again using the indirect strategy of uh, trying to target civilians. So these are bombings in public spaces, in uh, markets frequented by Shan people, in, uh, for example, Kunming ra uh, um, railway station, in uh, Tiananmen Square in uh, last October, etc. So these would be uh, attacks targeting civilians third uninvolved actor if we perceive the situation in Xinjiang as a conflict between radical Uyghurs as a violent conflict between uh, clusters of radicalized individuals and state power then uh, civilians are third uninvolved actor so number of uh, terrorist attacks is also growing uh, so <coughs> The situation is getting worse and worse every year and uh, Xinjiang is not stable. Puanting. Contrary to official claim or official policy, um, Xinjiang Work Forum, which has been held in uh, May last time and is <laughs> held, as I mentioned, every several months, uh, the outcomes of Xinjiang Work Forum are all, have been the same since 2010. Uh, policy until now has been correct by the central, it's declared as correct and it is uh, promised that it will continue in the current course. So 
One focus is uh, economy, continuing economic development of the province, and second is suppressing three forces of ethnic separatism, religious extremism, and violent terrorism. So these are two, let's say, legs on which uh, China's policy in Xinjiang is walking at the moment, and altogether, China declares that it will be continuing to preserve social stability which again if we uh, again we have to read the, the official statement correctly it will uh, it uh, it's actually saying that it will continue the current policy which strives to uh, establish um, or attain stability uh, despite the fact that the official, the actual situation is getting worse and worse, so it's actually so we can expect the future policy uh, will actually strengthen the instability which is going on in Xinjiang. I, I hope I have been clear. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the whole situation from official um, official or the from the central government or the, the party center is declared as a war on terrorism. It's painted in, in the colors or is represented, if we use Gardner Bovingdon's term, representational politics. The government seeks to represent the whole situation as a struggle or war on terrorism, on Uyghur radical Islamist terrorism, whereas Uyghurs, the radical Uyghurs, paint it as a liberation struggle and uh, more liberal uh, individuals uh, would say uh, that the situation is a uh, conflict of interest of uh, some of a majority of Uyghur uh, society with the priorities of Chinese government. We can also expect uh, uh, revival of radical Islam in Xinjiang because many Uyghurs are actually reacting to repressive policy by turning to Islam. So uh, during my last visits uh, the number of people who are veiled is growing. People who try to grow beard, who profess themselves to be radical to be Muslim who observe the prayer five five days five uh, times per day etc etc is growing it's not nowadays it's not easy for example in many places in Urumqi to get a beer in Uyghur restaurant which used to be normal um, we can also expect uh, in line with a recently concluded uh, fourth plenum of Communist Party of Chinese Communist Party, which was uh, which dealt with the topic of rule of law, we can uh, expect that uh, the regime in Xinjiang will have less and less common with uh, rule of law, and it will, on the contrary, have more and more common with rule by law. <coughs> Uh, there has been also debate about ethnic policy shift. Um, some Chinese uh, social scientists, such as, uh, for example, Ma Rung, uh, foremost specialist in ethnic issues, um, have uh, argued that the situation, the tense situation in Xinjiang and also unsolved issues in Tibet, because in Tibet there have been people burning themselves alive, for past few years, so and also there have been clashes, etc. So uh, some uh, Chinese specialists pointed out that it's uh, these uh, unsolved or resilient uh, mm. problems are because there is uh, the concept of uh, regional ethnic autonomy is uh, flawed, and it's time to uh, abandon the concept of regional ethnic autonomy, which means to um, abandon the concept of uh, autonomous regions of uh, affirmative action towards ethnic minorities, for example, in, uh, in entrance to universities, etc. 
We can also expect that uh, Xinjiang, in Xinjiang it will be more and more important for the government to uh, pay attention to what the uh, Han majority in the region is uh, thinking. We have seen the situation several times in past years when there have been uh, demonstrations by uh, Han, Han population, for example, in Urumqi, which actually managed to unseat several very high-ranking officials in uh, Xinjiang um, apparatus and ended by a replacement of the general secretary of Xinjiang party, Wang Lechuan, by Zhang Chunxian in 2010. So, um, in this sense, the situation in Xinjiang will become more and more of a social issue with Xinjiang characteristics. And implicitly it will be uh, less and less important how Uyghurs react to central government's policy in Xinjiang, for the central government. I think this would be all for the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much.